Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, my name is Amy Hartman and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about sleep and sensory processing and understanding specifically uh, the link um, between the two. And so um, before we begin, I'll give you a little background on me. I am a mother of two uh, young daughters. One is a very poor sleeper, the other one is an angel, um, like second children typically are. And I'm also an occupational therapist, um, a pediatric occupational therapist. And in um, my experiences, both as a mother and as a therapist, I had um, noticed that when I would not get good sleep or when the kids that I was working with um, didn't get good sleep, that all of our sensory systems or all of the sensory input that we receive through the day seem to be kind of exaggerated. Um, I especially noticed this in when I was in my um, sleep deprivation stages when I had my two kids um, 13 months apart. And so this led me to um, seeking a PhD in health and rehab sciences to kind of look at this um, connection. You know, could sleep problems be underlying, underlying uh, the difficulties that I was seeing with the kids that I was working with. Um, so with that, we're going to have a poll um, to see kind of who all is in the audience. Um, so if you can answer that, and then Allison will give us um, an idea of who's here. All right, it looks like we have a good majority of our audience as occupational therapists, 84% saying OT or assistant, 4% saying parent or guardian, 2% saying speech language pathologist or assistant, 3% saying physical therapist, and 7% saying other. Great, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I will say that I try not to be just focused on um, pediatrics here in this presentation, but I am a pediatric therapist, um, and so and my research is in children. Um, so if you do practice or you yourself experience um, sensory processing difficulties or you practice um, with or you um, treat other uh, older adults or adults or even adolescents, you can apply this information with anybody really who has a brain. <laughs> so, we'll get started. So, tonight we're going to be talking about sleep, um, the thing that children fight and parents love. Um, I want you to think a little bit for a moment about a time that you maybe didn't get enough sleep. Maybe you were camping and you woke up early with the sun, or maybe you had a sick family member or an exam or a project that you were up late working on. And then I want you to think about how did that next day feel? Um, did you notice anything? Oh, it's saying that maybe I stopped sharing my webcam. Oh, maybe that was my fault. Okay. Is that better? Can you see everything now? I can see everything, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I must have clicked something wrong. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're talking about that next day um, after a bad night's sleep. Maybe you remembered that you just weren't really focused. Um, maybe you felt just kind of not 100%. Um, what you might not have noticed in just that one poor night's sleep is that the insufficient sleep has an impact on literally every aspect of health, from how your heart pumps to how your hair grows, your hormones, your immune system, your brain health. Chronic insufficient sleep leads to increased risks of cancer, of heart attacks, of strokes. It's also a key indicator for Alzheimer's disease. It disrupts your blood sugar levels and it increases your appetite and decreases your self-control with food, which results in higher chances of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So all of these things are really critical for health and well-being. So what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to explain or kind of uncover exactly what sleep health is and why it's important to understand that good sleep goes beyond getting a certain amount of sleep each night or your sleep duration. Um, we'll also talk about why people with sensory processing dysfunction may have difficulties with sleep health. 
And to do that, we'll dive into the brain. Don't get nervous, it's fine. Um, and get into the neurology to understand really what's going on in sleep so that we can understand what might be contributing to poor sleep um, with people who have sensory processing dysfunction. And then that'll guide us to our final section where we'll talk about how to apply what we've learned in the clinical setting um, or in your own setting if you're a parent um, or someone who experiences sensory processing difficulties or experiences poor sleep. So um, first we're going to talk about sleep health. Um, in the chat, we're going to try this in the chat. Um, what are some ways that you think about sleep? Um, so when you're talking about sleep or you're asking somebody about their sleep, what kind of questions do you ask? My example on the screen is, how long did you sleep? Um, so think about that and if you feel inclined, pop it in the chat and we can kind of get an idea of some ideas. Right, so something is coming in. What time did you go to bed? Do you wake up feeling rested? How long does it take you to fall asleep? How many times did you wake up last night? How many hours of sleep? Uh, what are your routines for getting ready for sleep? How many times uh, did you wake up last night? How often did you wake up? Uh, sleep routines, how do you prep for sleep? Uh, what is your routine? Um, how well, what is the quality of your sleep? Um, do you have trouble falling asleep? Uh, what kind of covers do you like? Uh, do you have a nighttime routine, pre-bedtime pre routine? Uh, did you wake up in the night? Um, how restful is your sleep? Those are great. You can tell that we've got yeah. some occupational therapists. <laughs> Me too, <laughs> yes. routines. That's great. So, so I love hearing those things that kind of go beyond just how long did you sleep or looking for a magic number. You know, how are you feeling after you sleep? Um, did you wake up? What did you do before you went to bed? All those things do contribute to your overall sleep health. So when we talk about um, pediatric sleep health, um, we use this framework that was developed by doctors Meltzer, Williamson, and Mendel, um, which is actually taken from a sleep health framework for adults that Dr. Bicey here at the University of Pittsburgh put together. Um, so for if you're trying to apply this to yourself, um, you, can, you can definitely use this information. So if you can see my cursor here, right in the middle, we have pediatric sleep health, and these um, six words are your pillars for your sleep health. So you have uh, bedtime behaviors, your satisfaction with your sleep, um, daytime alertness, timing of your sleep period, um, sleep efficiency or the percent of, a percent of the time that you are in bed that you are actually asleep, and then your sleep duration. So all of these um, pieces kind of describe your overall sleep health. And it's important to note that these are within other, these are influenced and within other factors. So these big concentric circles um, characterize these different systems that can be um, influential in a pediatric sleep health or anyone's sleep health. So you have your child factors. This could be um, any um, um, genetic. Uh, components to a child, perhaps any medicine that they might be taking, um, their age, their race, their ethnicity, their chronotype. Are they night owls or are they morning larks? And then you have a larger group of family and school factors. So this would be um, interactions with caregivers who are putting them um, to bed. You can have um, other people who are in the house that are influencing the child and their stress. There's an interesting concept that I love to think about, which is family chaos um, and how that can impact sleep health. And then you have the larger um, neighborhood or the broader sociocultural factors. So this is, you know, is does a child have a safe um, environment to sleep in? Do they have a lot of environmental noise or light that could be impacting their sleep? And so these different systems are important to understand when we are starting to kind of uncover what sleep looks like. Of course, we can't intervene in all of these areas, but we can um, ask questions to try to characterize and understand um, where the supports are needed to help improve sleep health. 
So um, let's kind of take a little bit closer look because of these different dimensions, because this is going to be um, important for us to know as we start working towards applying what we're learning um, to uh, our, the, the children or the people that we're working with um, in the clinic. So we have sleep behaviors is the first one. This is unique to pediatric sleep. All the other ones are also associated with adult sleep, um, including regularity. So, um, but behaviors for children refers to how a child acts during a bedtime routine, um, also throughout their sleep period and then at their wake up time. So a couple of examples of what you might um, see or hear about um, when talking to parents or caregivers is that they might talk about their child stalling, which is a favorite around my house, um, curtain calls or coming out of bed multiple times um, to get one last hug or a sip of water or try to go to the bathroom one more time, um, any, any nightmares or nighttime awakenings um, can also be behavioral. Um, the second one is satisfaction with sleep. So how happy are you with your child's sleep? Are there certain problems that you notice each night um, about their sleep? And then if the, if the child or the adolescent is old enough, you can also ask them how confident or um, satisfied they are with their own sleep. There's daytime alertness. Um, so this encompasses sleepiness during the day and also nap taking. So do you notice the child being sleepy during a certain time of day or a certain activity? Um, is your child a car napper? I know that every time that we go to church on Saturday evenings, my five-year-old will fall asleep in our arms. And <laughs> it's just the timing and it's her sleepy, groggy time. Um, so that is, that's a daytime alertness um, little nugget that I could you know, describe um, for that child. Um, sleep timing. So what time does your child get into and out of bed each night? Um, does this change drastically over the weekend? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about sleep timing, but ideally this timing between weekday and weekend isn't longer than or isn't different more than an hour. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what social jet lag looks like, especially for teenagers when, um, and, um, and why that is bad. Sleep efficiency is our next one. Again, that's the percent of time that a person spends asleep during their sleep period. So from the moment they first fall asleep to the moment that they wake up for the last time. Um, and then sleep duration or the total sleep time. So understanding that sleep goes beyond just how long did you sleep is important because it's key to uncovering the complexity of sleep uh, for the kids that we work with and for our clients. So we should aim to capture all of these areas using different means of measurement so we can um, really understand what uh, sleep looks like. And we'll get into how to measure each of these in future slides. Okay, one more poll. Um, so how much sleep do you think is recommended for an elementary age child? There's, um, there are some uh, norms and recommendations out there. So I wanted to see what your thought is. You can do that by answering the poll. And this is probably the most common recommendation um, that is highlighted by pediatricians or by clinicians. Um, so if, and maybe if you're a parent, you might already know this. All right, so it looks like we have a kind of a range here. 2% saying two, 7 to 9 hours, 40% saying 8 to 10 hours, 48% uh, saying 9 to 11 hours, and 11% saying 10 to 13 hours. Wow, okay. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's see. So we'll start with the little guys. Um, so the National Sleep Foundations come up with these recommendations, and um, it goes from infants, um, so from 14 to 17 hours, um, all the way to older adults, which we'll get to. Now, what you'll notice is in the red boxes, our recommended range, um, there are some children, some people who need less or more, um, but anything beyond these 
lower and higher bounds really aren't recommended. And they're actually finding, there's research out there um, starting to look at long sleepers and how actually long sleep could be just as indicative of poor health as short sleep. Um, so keep that in mind. So our answer is nine to 11 hours um, for ele school-aged elementary um, children. You'll notice that um, the range that may be appropriate is seven to eight and may be appropriate um, is also 12 hours, but we're really aiming for nine to 11. And if we talk about sleep efficiency or that percent of time that you're actually asleep, um, as typical sleep efficiency for children is around 85%. So if a child is in bed for only nine hours, um, that means that they're not getting actually nine hours of sleep. So I always, when I'm working with parents or talking about um, sleep with people who are in my research studies, I encourage them to give, um, at least give a sleep opportunity um, within this range, knowing that they might be falling with um, on the lower bound of what may be appropriate. Um, and then if you will notice too that the recommended sleep um, goes down as people age and then kind of levels out as you get into adulthood at seven to nine hours. Okay, so how many children fall outside of these recommendations? Unfortunately, insufficient sleep is a widespread public health phenomenon um, that impacts 30% of typically developing children. And if we look at special populations, the bulk of studies conducted in special diagnostic populations has been conducted with children on the autism spectrum and also children with ADHD. So we find 80% of children with autism have significant sleep problems as reported by parents or as um, captured through actigraphy or activity monitoring um, or polysomnography, which are sleep studies and 65% of children with ADHD also report sleep problems. Most commonly, these problems are stalling at bedtime, difficulty falling asleep, waking in the middle of the night, and also having high anxiety at night. So what about other children with other diagnoses? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research um, with different diagnostic populations. What we've done in our lab, has, we've talked to a number of um, occupational therapy practitioners around the United States to ask, are they talking about sleep? Are sleep concerns coming up from parents? And what we found is that often they are not coming up um, with occupational therapists. And this could be because we don't specifically ask about sleep. Uh, perhaps caregivers don't think sleep's within our domain, or maybe caregivers are just used to their child's poor sleep or don't recognize sleep as being a contributor to daytime difficulties. So for those of us who are interested in what sleep looks like in children with sensory processing difficulties or other diagnoses other than autism and ADHD, we kind of have to be sleuth. So what we do know is that there are some symptoms that have been linked to poor sleep in children that we can use to give us hints about maybe sleep might be a, a contributor to the um, difficulties that we see in the clinic. So these are excessive movement seeking, difficulty with attention, anxiety or depression, poor impulse control, poor emotional regulation, poor academic performance, variable days, and also sensory processing difficulties. Studies looking at sleep in children with sensory processing deficits have been limited to those that we've already discussed, autism and ADHD diagnostic populations. So we're going to dive deep into the brain to look at what sleep looks like in typically developing children. And then we're going to apply our knowledge about the neurological differences in children with only sensory processing concerns to get a clearer picture of what the relationship might be between sensory processing and sleep. So once we have this knowledge, we'll be able to apply this understanding to the unique experiences of any of our clients with sensory processing difficulties, regardless of their diagnosis. 
So this is especially important because it can drive our clinical judgment and our therapeutic choices. So we're gonna dive into the neurology, and then at the end of, of this section, we'll take a moment for questions. If you have any questions as we're kind of going through this, feel free to put them in the chat, and then we can um, ask those in a few slides. So, everybody sleeps, but what actually is happening when we sleep? So there are two processes that facilitate um, the oscillation between um, wake and sleep, and that these two processes are process S, which you see up here, um, which is impacted on how long you've been awake or your sleep pressure, and process C, which hinges on your circadian rhythm and your melatonin production. Understanding the processes of sleep gives us questions to ask our clients and their caregivers to, under, to uncover potential sleep problems that can be targeted through intervention. So we're gonna go through each of these processes in detail and then align some questions that you can use in the clinic or with your own child. So let's get started with this alertness line. If you follow the line across time, you can see the fluctuation of alertness that peaks around 9 p.m. Now this is an adult model, um, so a child would probably peak closer to seven, six, maybe five, um, and then it quickly drops as we enter into our sleep period. This alertness level is impacted by both processes, process S and process C. Okay, so it's important to note that while these processes are driven primarily by happenings in the brain, we can and should, if we're intervening on sleep, adjust both process S and process C through adjustments in our daily routines and habits, which is why I think it's so important for OTs to be part of it. Um, for example, caffeine and napping can quickly change your sleep pressure, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. And then also sunlight, of all things, is the most powerful intervention tool to shift one's circadian rhythm, much more powerful than even taking melatonin supplements. We also can, our circadian rhythms are also informed by our routines, our daily routines, and any stress that might be happening during our life. So let's dive into these processes. Um, as we do, think about client, your clients or your children um, that you might be involved with, and um, think about the challenges that you might be seeing, and we can kind of practice applying our knowledge um, in those case studies. Okay, first, process C, or our circadian rhythm. So process C characterizes a cycle that's driven by this 24-hour rhythm um, called your circadian rhythm that's primarily driven by light exposure and melatonin production. So process C can be influenced, like we talked about, with our routines and our light. light. You can use light therapy also, like specific times and durations. Um, and um, brightness of light, and then also melatonin. But I will note that it is harder and it takes longer to change process S. So fun fact, number one, um, did you know that every organ of your body has an internal clock that has a unique rhythm? So you might have heard of your, your um, central clock or your main um, main clock, which is your suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is right here in the brain. But your liver has a rhythm that's unique from your gut's rhythm. And all of these rhythms are go cycle through a 24-hour cycle that turn off and on different processes for maximal functioning. So the master clock, which is in the hypothalamus, that suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN for short, synchronizes all these other peripheral clocks in the body to the time of day or the level of alertness needed. The SCN is also in charge of signaling to the body when it's time to shift from awake to asleep. So how does this tiny nucleus orchestrate this complex process? It does this by leveraging neurochemical specific structures within the brain. So we're gonna walk through the basic breakdown. There are three main areas that are important for sleep in process C. There's the retinal receptors in the eye, the hypothalamus, 
and the pineal gland. So here's what happens. Light comes through the retinal receptors in the eye and down through the retinal somatic tract um, during the day, which inhibits or stops the suprachiasmatic nucleus within the hypothalamus. Light also suppresses the pineal gland, which is where melatonin production is made. Um, but during the day, it's inhibited, so it's not making melatonin. When the sun goes down, this triggers, so it stops um, inhibiting the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and it triggers the um, glutamate, which is a neurochemical, um, which is excitatory within the central nervous system, to be released from the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And one of the places that it projects is the pineal gland. And so this glutamate acts, um, starts off the process of um, melatonin production, which is then pumped through the bloodstream and the cerebral spinal fluid to the body. And it helps us signify that it's time to um, get ready for bed or to go to sleep. So melatonin starts to increase in production about two hours before your habitual bedtime, and it peaks halfway through your slumber. Melatonin supports sleep maintenance, and it's known to decrease, unfortunately, as one ages, especially in female. Reduced melatonin levels are also found in certain subtypes of autism, in dementia, in mood disorders, in cancer, and type 2 diabetes. Now in adolescence, there's a natural shift or delay, let me see if it'll, yeah, there it is, um, in melatonin production that levels out as you get into adulthood. So this results in adolescence melatonin production starting closer to like 10, 11, maybe midnight, and then peaking around, you know, 6 or so a.m. So if you've heard of people advocating for later school start times in high school, this is the main driver. High schoolers are being made to wake up when their melatonin is peaking, resulting in high levels of sleepiness during the first hours of school. So by shifting school start times, advocates aim to better align teens' school and biological schedules to improve academic learning. So it is known that some diagnostic populations have specific um, sleep and circadian rhythm components that are either blunted or shifted. Um, as an example, I mentioned that there is a subset of children with autism that there's evidence that there's dysfunction in the melatonin production um, that leads to decreased, overall decreased levels of natural melatonin. So while there's not a lot of research out there in different diagnostic populations, it is important to look in the literature to see um, if you are working with a certain client or if you are experiencing a certain um, working with someone who has a diagn diagnosis um, to see if there's anything known about what sleep might look like for that um, person. So I've identified four studies here to kind of get you started um, as examples of um, known sleep or circadian rhythm differences. Okay, so remember everything is connected. So when we're looking at uncovering what someone's circadian rhythm looks like or their process C and what might be dysfunctioning, um, we can ask questions to kind of understand the rhythms that, that your client has throughout the day and night or even like across the week. So specifically, we might ask about a child's light exposure um, and timing. Is the child exposed to a lot of light in the evenings, like light from screens um, that might suppress the production of melatonin? Does the child get morning light to stop the production of melatonin and increase their alertness? We also know that social routines inform our circadian rhythms. So we can ask questions about typical activities or mealtime routines that might be informing a child's rhythm. Think about, so here's an example. If you have a child who um, after school has after school activities um, and gets home late, eats dinner right before going to bed regularly, and they're struggling to fall asleep. So what is the body, what signals are the body, is the body receiving? 
So from the food, the body is receiving a, um, a note like, it's time to eat. Let's start the digestion processes, which takes a lot of time. It involves really active processes in the gut. But then also, I'm also trying to get this child to fall asleep. So we're telling the, you know, we're dimming the lights, we're doing the routine, we're trying to tell the body, okay, now it's time to sleep, turn off all those daytime active processes, like digestion, which is what we need, um, because they just ate dinner, um, and, and you know, get to sleep. So this can be really confusing and not really supportive of an easy shift to, um, to sleep. Um, another thing to think about too, when we think about patterns and routines is that children and their caregivers can get into behavioral patterns when bedtime comes around. So you can ask questions about what does bedtime even look like? Um, what kind of behaviors are you seeing? How do you as the caregiver respond to those behaviors? Um, to kind of understand what that cycle might look like. So all these questions can lead you into your intervention choices um, that can address specific concerns that your client has. Um, and we're all trying, the, the big thing for process C is we're trying to support a robust circadian rhythm. And so that means that your body is, can assume what comes next. So you can support that in having consistent routines, um, looking at light exposure, keeping bright light in the morning, getting rid of bright light at night. Um, I'm sure if you've looked up anything about sleep, you will see you know, no screens, um, 30 to 60 minutes before bed. Um, and that's because of that light. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a question about blue blocker glasses. And I'll just say that um, there is some evidence that blue blocker glasses do a nice job at blocking out blue light, um, which is the strongest and the most informative um, light for the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, but also think about like what else is a child perhaps getting from screens. Um, there was an interesting study done with, um, I believe they were college age students or maybe high schoolers um, using social media to see kind of how um, is just engaging in social media with blue blockers still going to impact sleep. Um, or is it the blue blocker? Is it the light or is it the social engagement? And they found that it's both um, that can impact sleep negatively. Okay, so we're gonna shift to process S, um, which is your, um, your sleep pressure. So process S is also referred to as sleep pressure, um, like I mentioned, and the main driver um, is being awake for extended period of time. Um, and this produces a neurochemical called adenosine. Now, upon awakening, we have low levels of adenosine in our brain, um, but as we stay awake and time passes, adenosine builds up, um, which then turns into this sleepiness feeling. And then once we fall asleep, we'll see a quick um, decline in sleep pressure, which continues to decline until we wake. Um, when you have a substantial sleep pressure um, at the time that you're trying to go to sleep, you can easily transition into sleep. So this is an area to unpack with our clients. We can ask questions. We can't measure adenosine levels in the brain, um, but we can ask, um, does your child seem tired at bedtime? Is there resistance to sleep? Um, what the second wind is actually a thing, and I'll try to show it to you in this next graph, um, but are you catching the time where um, your child's sleep pressure is, is at an appropriate time and your circadian rhythm is, is um, on the de decrease because of that melatonin production? So it would be easy transition. Or are you going past it where, um, where you get, you're getting into the second wind? You can also ask questions about how do they look like in the morning? That was one of the things that somebody mentioned at the beginning. You know, are, you, are you groggy in the morning? Anything you know, groggy beyond 20 minutes of awakening could be indicative of not having good restful sleep. So this is a different graph to kind of show sleep pressure. And I won't spend too much time on this, but I think it's really interesting and it makes a lot of sense to me, especially if you're working with nappers or 
people who shouldn't be nappers that love napping. Anyway, um, so process C is kind of inverted here. Um, you have, first of all, process um, C is your, um, your circadian rhythm, and it is this dotted line. Process S is inverted, um, meaning like on this graph, the higher the sleep pressure kind of looks like this, but this blue line, um, as the blue line um, goes up, that means higher sleep pressure. And then upon sleep onset, like we see in this graph, um, your sleep pressure decreases. Um, and like I mentioned, it's easiest to sleep, uh, to fall asleep when your sleep pressure is high and your um, process C, your alertness, remember process C is all about alertness and melatonin, um, which supports sleepiness. So when your alertness level is going on the downhill swoop, and that's easy, an easy time to um, fall asleep. Now, if you nap, um, or if your child naps, uh, right when they fall asleep, their sleep pressure starts to sharply decline. And then when they wake up, um, again, their sleep pressure will start to increase. Now look at the differences between here on sleep onset um, and their sleep pressure here versus here. Same time, but as you can see, and this makes sense, right? If we've ever napped, we tend to stay up later um, before we go to bed because um, our sleep pressure is not as high. And so to think about, um, think about nap and nap timing. Another question that I want um, you to kind of unpack is those children who maybe have lots of night awakenings. Um, so this is this orange line that I've kind of crudely drawn. So say your child um, goes to sleep and then has an awakening and has a hard time falling back asleep. So they're up for quite a bit of time, maybe 30 minutes. And those 30 minutes, their sleep pressure starts to increase. And then they finally fall asleep, and so um, their sleep pressure declines, but then they wake up again, and so their sleep pressure increases, and on and on and on. So by the time it's time to wake up, instead of being down here after a restful night's of sleep, their sleep pressure is already starting higher. And then as they continue through the day, um, the, their sleep pressure um, exponentially grows and so they're more groggy or um, have a harder time um, engaging in their daily tasks. And so this, this could be um, an, another example of how um, the quality of a night's sleep or how often somebody wakes up in the middle of the night can impact um, sleep pressure specifically, but um, the next day's activities. Okay, so some examples of some questions that you can ask. Again, these are not questions like the end-all, be-all questions, just some to start you out, is asking about nap, nap timing, how long, um, how often do they wake at night, and what happens when they do, how do you react, how do you support, um, and then do they seem tired during the day, um, maybe a specific time or during a specific activity? Could that give you indication on what their sleep pressure might look like? So again, all of these questions are gonna lead you to your intervention choices. And so if you have a child with insufficient sleep pressure at night, um, perhaps you can talk about um, decreasing um, their naps or changing their nap timing, uh, maybe moving bedtime closer to the time that you think their sleep pressure could be sufficient. Um, so for example, if you have a child who naps, um, maybe their bedtime is instead of 8 p.m., which their parents are trying to put them down, maybe their bedtime has to be closer to 10 p.m. Um, you can also look at limiting food and drinks that impact sleep pressure, so caffeine um, or sugar. Caffeine is tricky. So caffeine, the way that caffeine works is it blocks um, the receptors of adenosine. So it makes you not feel the effects, um, but that doesn't mean that adenosine doesn't build up. Um, so as caffeine um, uh, is uh, integrated into your system, then the adenosine will hit you and you'll get that slump, um, typically in the afternoon. But if you, if you are someone who is very sensitive to caffeine, um, or if you are drinking caffeine or um, eating things that have caffeine in them um, later on in the day, that can significantly impact your sleep. 
Um, another thing to note is that caffeine has a very long half-life. Um, and so if, um, if you're working with somebody who struggles with sleep and is eating or drinking anything with caffeine or sugar, um, that's something that you can consider discussing, adjusting the timing and the amount um, of that caffeine. Okay, so with that, um, let's take a moment and see if there are any questions or clarification uh, points in the chat uh, before we shift. All right, so one question coming in, um, going back to the amount of time uh, recommended for sleep, does that include naps as well? Yes, yes, so um, that does include naps, um, especially for the infants. I think I think it wouldn't include naps um, for older kids. Okay, is there a best time to take melatonin, uh, for example, an hour before bedtime? Yeah. So, um, a little bit about melatonin. It is not FDA approved and it's not regulated. So, um, anytime I'm talking with um, talking with people who are using melatonin, I just let them know that. Um, with that, there was an interesting study I think NPR covered where they um, looked at a bunch of melatonin on the shelf that they could um, test in the lab to see really what it was made of. And it ranged from like being 20% of what was on the label to 200% of what's on the label. So it might say like five milligrams. Um, and also some different um, melatonin labels. Um, also had other things like serotonin or other things that weren't on the label in the pills. So just to be aware of that, um, I always encourage people to work with um, their doctors if they're going to be using melatonin. Um, from a sleep perspective, the lower the dose, um, the more it's going to support your circadian rhythm. Um, so if you're talking about shifting your circadian rhythm, you're working with like one milligram, like two hours before bed. But that's usually not what we're doing. We're really wanting to support sleep. And so typically we're looking at um, 30 minutes to 45 minutes before bed. And that's typically at levels like three to five milligrams. Um, and that will help increase that uh, melatonin production or that feeling of melatonin in the body and um, help you transition to sleep. Um, the other thing is that melatonin hasn't really been researched well in, uh, in uh, children, more in adults and more, um, there is research in that subset of autism that has deficits in melatonin production. Um, but just to be aware of that, those are kind of my caveats with um, melatonin, but usually it's 30 to 45 minutes before bed. Um, in like anywhere from one, probably one to three for kids uh, milligrams. All right, what do you mean by sleep pressure? Ah, so sleep pressure is really just that sleepiness feeling. Um, specifically, it's like a pressure within your synapses. So in that, um, I'll kind of go backwards in, maybe here. So in the synapse, thick clef here, it, it's why they call it a pressure is because there's just building up of these little adenosine molecules. Um, but really, for all intents and purposes, it's just the, the sleepiness feeling. Um, all right. But did you say it was harder to change process C or process S? It is pro it's harder and takes longer to change process C or your circadian rhythm. It takes more input. Uh, awesome. All right, I heard if one cannot sleep instead of trying to force himself to go back to sleep, it's actually more effective to get up and do something such as get a late night snack. Is that true and what's your opinion? So that is, um, I don't know that snack would necessarily be my first go, but um, I think you're probably, something that you've heard, or what you've heard is probably what we talk about for people who struggle with insomnia, which is um, sleep restriction. So going to bed when you're tired so that you can start associating your bed with um, falling asleep right away. Um, and then the idea is um, once you get that, say even if it's just for four hours that you're sleeping, um, then you can slowly increase your um, time asleep. 
that works again for people who have insomnia and typically for adults. For kids, it's a little bit tougher, right? You're not going to be, um, you know, if, you're, if your child is struggling to fall asleep, it's hard to tell a parent, well, you know what, go ahead, get them out of bed, let them, you know, quickly play for a couple of hours and then try to put them bed to bed around, you know, 10 or 11. Because parents want that time um, to themselves and kids need that sleep and we all know that. Um, so I think for insomnia, um, yes, it is. If you can't fall asleep within 20 to 30 minutes of getting into bed, um, it is suggested that you get out of bed, keep the light dim, and engage in something quiet um, and non-screen related. So often we talk about maybe um, sitting in a dim light and read a book, which my dad would always be like, you're going to ruin your eyes, um, but don't turn on those bright lights. Um, because what is the bright light doing but um, stopping that melatonin production, which is the opposite of what you want. Um, but for kids, honestly, I would, um, I would probably try to unpack that a little bit more. Are there other ways that you can help support them to transition to sleep easier than taking them out of their bed or out of their room? Um, and if you want to try to take them out of their bed until they're sleepy, I would suggest keeping them um, engaged in something that's not going to be behaviorally um, uh, sought out, right? So if my child knows that if she resists going to bed for 30 minutes, I'll go in and read her a book or let her stay up and play with her toys, she's obviously not going to try to fall asleep. Um, so just kind of be conscientious of that um, aspect too. All right, last question for this section. Uh, does taking melatonin supplement inhibit the natural production of it in the body? That's a really great question. Um, no, I, I do not believe I have read anything that it actually um, inhibits melatonin production. The way that it gets processed in the body, um, I don't believe actually reaches the pineal gland. Um, but don't quote me on that. But I've also read that it is not um, addictive um, and it's not going to impact um, the way that your your body produces melatonin. So, um, but again, you know, with the caveat that research in children is limited. Um, so I would always um, encourage you to work in tandem with um, your pediatrician. Okay. Okay, so we will um, dive into specifically uh, the sleep health of children with sensory processing difficulties. Okay, so before we dive into the brain um, again, let's remind ourselves of what, um, what arousal system dysfunction looks like in children with sensory processing difficulties. Um, so in this visual on the left, which was developed by Patricia and Julia Wilbarger, um, you can see the three different bands of arousal. We have our optimal range of arousal, this is when you can transition from task to task best and learn and overall just function best. There's also low arousal and then high arousal or sensory overload. So now let's layer on the task of sleep. So generally speaking during the day, the areas in the brain that promote sleep um, are actively being inhibited. So remember we talked about light inhibiting the SDN um, other, other systems are also being inhibited during the day. Now at night, this kind of seesaws, and now the sleep systems are being activated and the alerting systems are being inhibited. So this is a skill transition from wake to sleep. That is a transition when we can, we can do in our optimal range of arousal, but it becomes more difficult when we're overloaded. And so, my question is, where are all the kids or the people with sensory processing concerns after a full day of stimuli? Typically up here in sensory overload. So this leads us to, okay, let's look at back at these areas that we have information about poor sleep, these different populations. And what is the prevalence of sensory processing in these groups? Interesting. Sensory processing deficits are common in the groups that have high rates of sleep, 
sleep problems also. There have been few studies that have even looked at the severity of sensory processing difficulties within poor sleeping children in each of these groups. And they found that um, the higher rates, the higher reports to sensory processing difficulties correlate to higher incidences of sleep problems. So the kids, so one example that I always think about is um, a study of children who are coming to a sleep clinic because their sleep is poor with no other diagnoses. And they gave them all a measure of sensory processing. Um, I believe it was a sensory processing measure. Um, well, aptly named, aptly named. Um, and they found that those who had worse sleep had worse sensory processing. So it's worth noting that children with sensory research in children with sensory processing disorder is emerging, and prevalence data on sleep problems is lacking. So in our current study, which we haven't published yet, um, we're finding that parents report sleep problems as high as 91 percent in children who just have sensory processing sensitivities with no other diagnoses. Um, they were ruled out if they had autism or ADHD. Um, so there quite possibly um, could be a connection. Um, so my question then is, could, could we be seeing kind of a cycle? Um, could the children be, pre um, be presenting with unknown Sleep problems and we're seeing these sensory processing deficits because remember sensory processing problems are a, um, a common occurrence with kids who have poor sleep and then also could our sensory processing difficulties be contributing to poor sleep so we searched the neuroscience literature and we found convincing support that there are two specific areas in the brain um, that we're going to talk about um, that could be um, integral to understanding the connection um, between sleep and sensory processing. Okay, so if we dive in, here's what we found. The hypothalamus and the thalamus um, are two areas that show some similarities um, between poor sleeping children and also children with sensory processing. Before we lay out that, let me just remind you about what these two areas in the brain do. The hypothalamus plays a vital role in monitoring the state of the body in the brain, including arousal and stress. So to measure arousal or stress, we use salivary cortisol and electrodermal activity or skin conductance or sweaty palms. And these are indications of the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and the sympathetic adrenal modulary um, activity, or SAM. The thalamus um, is involved in controlling arousal and sleep, in addition to filtering out sensory input to assist in sensory processing. Um, to measure somatic activity, um, event-related potentials can be measured using um, electroencephalography, or EEG. So if we look at the literature, what we find is poor sleeping children um, have higher levels of stress or daily, um, daily cortisol and larger spikes of cortisol after sensory stimuli, which is similar to what we see in children with sensory processing concerns. We also see higher electrodermal reactivity in response to st sensory stimuli in both poor sleeping children and children with sensory processing difficulties. And then sensory proce children with sensory processing difficulties uniquely show limited habituation and more variation to repeated sensory stimuli um, than their peers. Finally, sensory gating is also noted to be impacted in poor sleeping children. And interestingly, has been noted to improve during a sleep extension period in adults. In children with sensory processing difficulties, differences in gating abilities is noted um, to be uh, when compared to neurotypical kids, but there is further studies needed. And as a note, um, the majority of the research that has happened in children with sensory processing concerns um, has been done in children with sensory modulation disorder, specifically over-responsive type. Um, so those who are overly responsive or sensitive to sensory stimuli. 
So again, we're going to have another pause for some questions. So start putting those in the chat. I'm going to lay out a theoretical model um, to kind of to take you or to, for you to take with you um, to kind of apply all of this information. And then we're going to go into our final section um, of how to apply all this information. Um, so, so here's our theoretical model. So to start, we've outlined there's a well-known connection um, with sensory processing deficits and arousal system dysfunction. That is a common target in therapy. But what is also well known, but maybe not as often discussed in care of children with sensory processing dysfunction, is the connection between the arousal system dysfunction and sleep difficulties. And so we, while we might be impacting the sleep problems through our interventions to address the arousal system dysfunction, we also should understand that sleep difficulties are innate um, in children with sensory processing difficulties, and we should incorporate this in our intervention. So like I said, research is still being conducted to uncover exactly what this relationship is in children, but from the literature, we can assume that there's some sort of cyclical relationship just through understanding the processes of sensory processing and the two processes of sleep. So just to kind of recap, sensory processing difficulties can make it hard to initiate and maintain sleep to do that kind of um, teeter-totter to sleep. And then if you get poor sleep, that in turn increases your sensory processing difficulties in the following days. And we see this in typically developing children and also adults who have been sleep deprived on purpose for research. You see these sensory gating and sensory processing difficulties um, in the following days. So there's this, just a cyclical um, problem. So it's our hope that through recognizing this link, we can start exploring sleep for the sake of sleep and health, because remember, that's that first slide of how important sleep is, but also with the understanding that it really is impacting all of our other goal areas that we might be working on in therapy or in life with that child or person. Okay, so before we get into assessment and intervention, I'll pause for any other questions. And then we will have a question and answer at the end, too. All right. So a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, what are some of the functional and practical ways you'd recommend get, kids get exposure to that morning light each day, thinking of school days where parents may not be with their children during the morning light hours? That's a good question, especially in the winter. Um, I think that being cognizant of um, even just the inside lights that we get, um, so maybe that's um, when the child is waking up um, and getting ready for the day, turning on the overhead lights, um, and you know when natural light is um, when kids are waking up and it is naturally light outside, you know if you can you know, spend some extra time in the sunshine while you're waiting for the bus or um, when you're eating breakfast, you know, scoot over to, um, you know, face the sun. Um, another thing to think about um, if you are in the capacity to impact the way that um, children receive lights in the schools, um, you can advocate for, um, you know, having good light, which I'm assuming most schools have really good lights um, so that kids can see. Um, really. Morning light is wonderful and it's really important, especially in the darker times in the year. But really evening light is probably the bigger culprit that we're um, impacting um, for intervention. So talking about dimming lights, maybe not using overhead lights, but using lamp lights, you know, starting at 6 p.m. Um, or um, at putting dimmer switches um, throughout the house to help support everybody's circadian rhythm because it's important for adults too like i'm sure all of us sitting in front of our screens are probably like what this is probably not good for my circadian rhythm at you know on the east coast 8 p.m um but that's yeah so those are my suggestions right so i've heard magnesium uh may also be a good um a more effective hormone compared to melatonin for promoting sleep uh, do you have any research with kids and uh, taking magnesium to assist with falling asleep and staying asleep? You know, I have not um, looked up magnesium specifically, although I do recall um, one of the therapists that I interviewed in other studies, which we'll talk about next, um, talking about um, their clients using magnesium. But I don't know that literature. I would 
and and the fact that I don't know it, I will definitely look into it. Um, I know that a lot of the discussion about supporting sleep using supplements um, in children is centered around melatonin. The other great thing about um, sleep intervention is that melatonin and um, like pills are actually not the first line of defense. It is behavioral change and environment change. Um, but thank you for asking that question. I will make sure to look up magnesium um, after this. All right, we have a couple of people asking what sensory gating is. Okay, so sensory gating is, um, is the way, it's the terminology um, about what happens in the thalamus. Um, and it's basically filtering out non-important sensory stimuli. So an example is like me sitting here, I can, if I focus in on it, I can feel um, my chair, you know, giving tactile input to my legs. Um, I can, if I focus on it, hear the fan that is cooling my computer. Um, but when I'm talking, I'm not really attending to those two things. So my brain, um, that sensory input's still coming in. My ears are still working. You know, my um, my skin on my legs is still feeling, but my brain kind of filters that away to say that's not important. It's not noxious. It's not harmful. You don't need to attend to it. And so, children with sensory processing difficulties sometimes have difficulty filtering that out. Um, so they would be um, the fan and the computer would be constantly humming, and so it would be hard for them to kind of parse out. Um, the auditory input that is important, um, so for an example. And so what they found in the literature as far as sensory getting and sleep goes, when you haven't had a lot of good sleep, like for example, in these studies where they sleep deprive adults um, and then they give them a really um, active or sensory rich environment where they have lots of different things to attend to, it's hard for them to hone in and focus in on um, the sensory input that's important. Um, and so envision this happening in school, right? If you have a child who has difficulty filtering, whether it's because of poor sleep or because of sensory processing difficulties, and you put them in the middle of their classroom with 29 other children and a teacher talking and people walking in the halls and, you know, and then you say, okay, go ahead and learn, that can be really difficult. All right, we'll do one more question and save the rest for the end. Uh, what is sleep extension? So sleep extension is probably pre pre predominantly used in research, and that means um, just in a, in a study where um, they're looking at what sleep um, restriction looks like, they'll have, um, or sleep deprivation might look like, um, they'll, they sometimes will also have a sleep extension phase. So they'll say, okay, um, in this study protocol, you'll come into our sleep lab and you'll have your normal sleep, which say is like for adults would be like an eight hour sleep opportunity period where you're laying in bed for eight hours. You'll, you might have a sleep restriction um, phase where you, you know, for a couple of days, you only get three hours of sleep opportunity. And then you'll follow that up with um, a sleep extension phase where you have um, an opportunity maybe for 10 hours that you can sleep. Um, so basically that that little bit was talking about how in adults they've done um, a study where or a number of studies where they've restricted sleep or deprived somebody of sleep and then given them a extension phase to look at what sensory gating looks like in both conditions so when they are sleep deprived but then they when they also have an ample opportunity to sleep and um, Actually, I think the study that I was referring to, actually, they did a typical night's sleep. So an eight-hour sleep period, measured sleep gating, and then a sleep extension period where they had a longer time, maybe 10 hours, I'm not remembering correctly, or exactly, um, and measured sensory gating. And they found that with that sleep extension, um, sensory gating improved um, uh, compared to with their normal sleep period. Okay, so let's talk about applying this, either in the clinic or in your own life. Um, we've just gone through some really pointed questions in the, in the um, slides about what exactly is happening in, during sleep. And so, um, so, you, so that's kind of the first part that I want to 
um, focus in on. Um, so uh, one other thing before we kind of go into here, another thing that I want to remind you of is those sleep health dimensions. Um, remember, it's important to measure all the complexity of sleep health, um, not just how did you sleep or how long did you sleep. Um, and it's important to do this because it can give you an idea of maybe how far off the norm your child or your client is, um, which sometimes can be helpful. Um, if we know that typically like recommendations um, for children is to get nine to 11 hours of sleep and, and the kid that you're working with, your own child um, is only receiving six hours of sleep each night. We know that that's probably, it's outside of the recommendations and probably not um, best. And also measuring the different components of sleep health can also give you more insight into how sleep might be impacted um, and then thus lead you to certain different sleep intervention aspects that might be um, especially useful for your client. And then it also helps us capture change um, if we are um, in, um, impacting sleep. Um, so, okay, so we'll start off with a clinical interview, which is where I would encourage everyone to start. Um, so asking those questions um, and remembering to ask questions not only about the child factors, but also outside of those concentric circles in the pediatric sleep health framework, um, asking questions about the family and the school factors um, and also the um, environmental or the sociocultural factors um, to get a really good picture of um, what sleep health might look like. So I mentioned that um, we've talked to a number of occupational therapists in the United States about um, how they approach sleep or what their perceptions were on sleep health. And what we found was um, it really, a lot of um, occupational therapists um, were finding that sleep wasn't really coming up. And um, when OTs were asking about sleep, um, these were their common questions. So what are your bedtime routines? Does your environment support sleep? And have you tried calming or sensory strategies or helping a family find calming or sensory strategies to, have, to incorporate um, within the bedtime routine or as the child is falling asleep? Also, most occupational therapists reported that beyond using sensory strategies to get the child ready for bed, and making small adaptations to the routines or the environments to support sleep, they weren't confident in the next steps towards intervention. So one of the things that I want to start with is, okay, we've asked some questions. We've got some really good um, understanding on like what exactly is going on in sleep. We've tried to uncover what their sleep what the child's sleep pressure might look like. We tried to uncover what their routines and their circadian rhythm might look like. So how are we going to actually do some measurement? Um, how can, and remember measuring can help us figure out what is changing. Um, in addition to parents reporting like, oh yeah, I feel like the child um, is more alert or we're having less meltdowns or um, the teacher says they've had a really good week and you know we've been really honing in on our bedtime routine or our light exposure at night. Um, it's also nice to kind of try to capture these things in, in other ways. So there are many ways to measure sleep and we can and should use multiple ways to capture these multiple dimensions of sleep health. So on this slide, I've got the multiple dimensions of sleep health here, which we'll kind of bring through in the different uh, sleep assessments. And I wanted to kind of highlight uh, these different um, components. So we have medical assistance measurements. This is where um, um, typically these are done in either a sleep lab or with a sleep um, team. Some of them are at home, like a sleep test, home sleep test. We have caregiver and self-assessment. Um, these are like questionnaires or sleep diaries. Then we also have hardware devices, um, which are kind of separated into contact and contact list devices. We're going to go through each one of these and give you some more information and detail. Um, but do you see how many options you have? I mean, there are, really are a lot of different ways to measure sleep. 
it doesn't mean that each one is the right one um, or any one is the right one. You really have to understand kind of what the question that you're asking is. So we'll start start with polysomnography, um, which is kind of the gold standard. Well, it is. It's not kind of. It is the gold standard of measuring sleep. Um, these these are also called sleep studies, and they're used when one wants to understand them, like kind of the mechanisms of sleep. Um, so a sleep study gives you a picture of the stages of sleep um, that a person experiences using electromagnetic signals picked up at the scalp. So if you can see in this picture, this little girl has these um, EEG lens, uh, leads on her head and on her face. Um, now, if you remember, sleep originates deep in the hypothalamus, which is in your like deep brain, which is far from the cortex where the, the signals are being picked up. However, this is the closest way we can um, get to capturing the nuances between the different waveforms of, that we see in sleep. So sleep studies are often used when there's a concern about sleep apnea or seizures or other complex neurological considerations that might impact sleep. Um, sleep studies often take place over the course of one to three nights. They usually take place in a sleep lab. However, there are some home sleep studies that can be used in certain situations. Sleep studies are also expensive. And they often take a, t a while to get scheduled because there's a limited number of sleep labs. So often when we're talking about sleep for our clients in rehab sciences or even um, within the schools or within your own home, we don't necessarily need this type of information. However, if you have the, cap uh, the capacity to get this information from your child, say um, your client has already had a sleep study, it's a great opportunity to get a glimpse into what their sleep architecture looks like. So how often are they in stage one sleep, stage two, or um, deep sleep, or REM sleep, which is dream sleep. Now, if you've ever used um, like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or another activity monitor, which we'll talk about later, um, you might notice that um, they try to estimate these different stages of sleep. Now, the way that a polysomnography um, estimates or um, characterizes the stages of sleep is literally by the way that our brain waves um, are, are forming. And so really, this is the only way that we can get really good sleep measurement. I was reading um, last night a couple of um, studies that they've done to compare the different um, activity monitors out there with polysomnography. Again, this is our gold standard and comparing how often they were correct um, with estimating and staging sleep. And um, it wasn't all that often. Um, they are good, well, we'll get into the, the pros and cons of um, of activity monitors, but just to note that polysomnography um, is the really the only good way to stage sleep. So on the opposite side of the burden spectrum lies questionnaires. So questionnaires give us a nice subjective look at um, your client or your child's sleep. There are parent reported questionnaires like this brief infant sleep questionnaire. Um, and there's also self reported questionnaires for older children. So here is the brief infant sleep questionnaire. And I put the website babysleep.com backslash BISQ here because um, this is how you can access um, this questionnaire. The sleep world is really nice because you can access these as clinicians or as parents. Um, you can access them for free typically for use. Um, you don't have to buy them. And there's some good normative data out there too. Um, but this website also has some really good information about child and infant sleep and, um, and also a behavior chart, which um, can be helpful if you're talking about um, impacting kind of that bedtime routine um, or any behaviors surrounding sleep. So the uh, Brief Infant Sleep Questionnaire um, has 33 items. There's a short form. And then it also, it produces three subsections um, about just generally the infant sleep, the parent's perception, and then also the parent's behavior um, related to their child's sleep. You have the Children's Sleep Habits Questionnaire. Um, this is good for children. Um, 
think the lowest age is four. Um, and parents do, parents um, complete this one. It is a little bit longer, 45 items, and produces eight subsections. If you notice that a lot of these sections link up with the sleep um, health dimension. So we have kind of behaviors, right? Bedtime resistance, you have sleep duration, um, parasomnias, which are kind of like nightmares or, um, or yeah, nightmares. Sleep disordered breathing is in kind of a subsection. Um, you have this daytime sleepiness, um, which is one of our domains. Um, and then you also get a little bit of insight into sleep anxiety and sleep onset delay, which is like um, how long it takes a child to, to get to sleep. Um, and then we also have the children's report of sleep patterns. And this is a child report, similar. Um, that it, it produces some subsections that are um, that align with the, the um, domains. And I'm just seeing the time too, so I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of this. The Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index is one, is a questionnaire for adolescents and adults. Um, it is widely used. And then we briefly talked about um, wearables. So these are activity monitors. They um, estimate sleep um, using movement. Um, and the the pro of using activity monitors is that for the most part, most of these have pretty good um, rates of indicating when somebody is asleep. They are less accurate when it comes to um, identifying awakenings. So nighttime awakenings or the time in which you wake up, um, or if you're moving around a lot, but you're actually asleep, it's gonna count that as wake. Um, but overall, to like capture kind of how long your sleep period was, um, they do relatively well. And the nice thing is, too is that you can capture the longitudinal perspective. So, you know, a whole week of things, of um, data. Um, there is not a lot out there on using these devices for children. And a lot of the children's um, activity monitors actually don't capture sleep. So that is a big limitation. And then there's also contact list devices. So these are like apps or bed sensors that can help estimate sleep. But just remember, like the sleep measurement is only good at, as good as the data that you put in. So if you're trying to estimate sleep by just using the microphone to monitor your breathing, how really, how like how really, how good is that? Um, I would be a little bit worried about um, the accuracy in that. And then sleep diaries can, I, honestly, is one of my favorite ways to capture sleep. Um, it's not fancy, it's been around forever. These can be paper or electronic. There are some apps that are sleep diaries. And um, so this is the consensus sleep diary that I'm showing you here. Um, but basically it's just a number of questions, some of which talk about the timing. Um, so like what time did you get out of bed? What time did you get in bed? What time did you try to fall asleep? How long do you think it took you to fall asleep? Um, and you can tailor these questions to capture the things that you want. Um, the nice thing about sleep diaries is that the, the child or the parent, I guess, or the um, child if they're old enough is asked to do these right away so they don't have to remember. Um, and it, it gives you some really good data. And you can capture it across time. This is another one that's just more visual. So um, here you have if it's a work day or a work or a off day. And then the shaded areas are when they're sleeping, this person's sleep is very poor. Um, the lines here are like when they got into bed. You have um, times when medication and exercise have been done, and then alcohol and caffeine, this was an adult. Um, but you can kind of have an idea of what sleep looks like this way. So just to kind of recap, all of these different things um, can capture some of the domains, but this is why um, we need to use multiple means to capture the different domains of sleep health. So polysomnography and questionnaires are here actigraphy and then apps or nearables can capture some. And then questionnaire or, uh, sleep diaries, or rather, you could probably hit on the majority of the um, domains. 
So one last piece, and then maybe we'll have time for a, a last question or two. Um, there are guiding principles on sleep intervention everywhere. And I'm sorry that this is the last um, part. I'm sure this is like, so what do I do about it? Um, but here are the main, here are the main, keep a constant routine or a consistent routine. That's gonna support your circadian rhythm. It's gonna help your body know what's coming, um, what's coming up next. And you can incorporate in your consistent routine any sensory supports that a child might need. Put your child to bed when they're tired. Again, we kind of talked about this already. It's a little trickier um, with kids, but trying to be cognizant of that sleep pressure. Limit screen time and bright lights an hour before bed and get morning sunlight. Um, limit sunlight in the evenings or wear sunglasses. Engage in calming activities prior to bed like a warm bath or quiet reading. Based on the literature, these sleep intervention techniques have not been analyzed specifically for children with sensory processing difficulties. However, we can take our knowledge about what these sleep intervention techniques are adjusting or um, giving us and apply similar uh, concepts to our interventions with clients with sensory processing difficulties. So for those children or people, we can look at um, so, well, first of all, remember that their arousal systems are different and they might need additional help or cues um, to start the sleep process. So what we can do is look at the cues that the child's receiving from the environment that's informing the master clock, so that's primarily light, and the peripheral clocks like food and activity, socialization, and then set up those routines that help bolster that robust circadian rhythm and their sleep pressure like getting morning light and activity, eating at regular times. We also know that children with sensory processing concerns often have, I like to have control over their schedules and their environment because so many things feel noxious to them. So we can add in extra supports for these children to help them um, with transitioning to, into sleep, like a regular bedtime routine, picture schedules, choices of calming activities, Predictable routines can ease that child into bedtime and minimize any anxiety that otherwise might be present. Also decreases that parental stress that kids pick up on. And then finally, um, something that should come as no surprise, brainstorm with the child and the family about organizing and calming activities to engage in prior to bedtime. Um, and this will help um, decrease their arousal system and support that transition to sleep. Um, and this could be in the form of like a sensory diet um, leading into the bedtime routine, or it could be specific sensory tools like compression sheets um, or a weighted blanket or a massage uh, prior to bedtime. So none of this should probably be a surprise, um, but hopefully this uh, laying it all out in this way and giving you kind of the foundational tools will help you start to consider sleep for sleep's sake um, and help you kind of to build that into your um, everyday interventions or your everyday life. So with that, I'd like to thank Therapro for this opportunity to work, um, to present, and also to uh, my wonderful team um, at the University of Pittsburgh um, within the Pediatric Research Lab and also in the Circadian, the Center for Sleep and Circadian Science. Um, and so if there are any last questions before we go, or if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me and I can um, absolutely follow up. Awesome, okay, we do have many questions in here, so maybe we'll try to get to some of them. Um, and then thank you for providing your follow-up email. Uh, before we get into those questions, though, I do wanna be respectful of those who have to leave right at uh, the end of the webinar. So the um, exit code for tonight's webinar, it is in the chat box. Uh, it is Therapro2346, so capital T-H-E-R-A-P-R-O-2346, so Therapro two, three, four, six. Um, that's in your chat box for anybody who needs it. Uh, let's try to get to some of these questions before we say goodnight. Um, all right, I'm gonna combine a couple here just in the interest of saving time. Uh, recommendations on DreamPad, and if so, your what's your, uh, your experience? And then kind of with that, um, noise uh, machines and white noise machines. 
So DreamPad, I do not have experience in, so I cannot offer any information, unfortunately, on that. Um, sound machines, I think, can be really helpful um, as far as helping with that sensory gating that we talked about before. So the idea is that if you have a sound machine, which is quiet, the like the level of a quiet shower, and it took me forever to understand what exactly that means, but if you think about like turning on your shower in your bathroom, and then stepping outside of the door, that's kind of the level of noise that you should be doing. And that idea is that it kind of covers up any other little noises that you might have during the house and helps promote um, deeper sleep. But um, again, I think that's something that sometimes helps, sometimes does not necessarily um, help. So it would be a per person uh, preference. All right, how many hours prior to bed should we start dimming lights? I would say two hours before bed. So remember, uh, melatonin production um, starts two hours prior to your habitual bedtime. And if we're wanting to really support that um, melatonin production, then I would, um, I start dimming our lights <laughs> right after dinner. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, two hours. All right, many classrooms have light filters. What are your thoughts on these? I think I would probably ask um, what kind of light filters. So if um, there are lots of different waves of light, um, blue light is the one that is the most impactful for um, your circadian rhythm and your uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, I think that's more, I think, of a sensory processing question rather than a promoting um, kind of sleep and alertness question. Um, but I guess the short answer is I don't know why light filters would be harmful to either. I feel like either sensory processing or sleep, um, but I think I'd have to think a little bit more on that. Okay, uh, kind of a combined question again. What are compression sheets and have you uh, seen research on weighted items during sleep? Yeah, so there is there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of research on weighted blankets, and off and a lot of the research is actually like mm, eh, you know inconclusive. Um, there's been a couple of studies with weighted blankets and um, supporting sleep for children with autism, um, and again, it's kind of inconclusive. Um, I think that using weighted blankets is something again that you can try um, per family per person to see if it works. Um, they say about 10% of your body weight is a good place to start, although sometimes that feels too heavy or too weight, depending on what the, the person needs. Compression sheets are kind of like if you've ever used compression clothing or a compression vest. It's just like, um, I envision it, it's kind of like a fitted sheet on top of, like instead of like a flat sheet. So it kind of, it checks in and you kind of get inside, kind of like a, um, a sleeping bag, but it gives kind of that compression that like tight clothes give you um, while you're sleeping. Um, so that's something to try. I've always, I've also had um, a therapist tell me that they've just used a larger um, flat sheet and tucked it into the sides of the bed for the child so that they, the child had to like kind of get in at the pillow and then it's like really nice and tight. I've also heard of families using um, sleeping bags and maybe smaller sleeping bags for the child so the, the child feels that kind of cocoon feeling because that seems to be supportive for them. All right, a lot of sleep assessment options require the individual to be verbal with someone, uh, someone nonverbal. How can we better get their personal view of their quality of sleep without always relying on the parent or educators? I love that idea. I think that, you know, um, as much as there are limitations for more objective sleep measures like activi activity monitors, um, that would be helpful, but you're right, that doesn't really capture the person's uh, perspective. I'm wondering if you couldn't use one of the, um, some of the basic questions that you're interested in. Um, so do you feel tired or do you feel rested? Did you get a good night's sleep or a bad night's sleep? And, um, and adjust those into more of a visual scale. Um, 
but there is not anything that I have come across at least. Um, although I wonder if there is any sleep question. Um, I have a colleague that's working in working with um, people with aphasia, and she's looking at sleep and how to capture their uh, perspectives on their sleep. And I'll have to ask her to see, I know that she's talking about having to adjust some questionnaires um, to help uh, people with aphasia. Um, so similarly, I think that that's a, an opportunity for um, a, adjustment of, a, of either the specific sleep questions that you're asking or an existing tool um, to help capture that person's perspective.